So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rick Zimmerman of NCTA, the Internet and Television Association, and a longtime board member of the Internet Education Foundation. It's my pleasure today to introduce one of Philadelphia's finest to lead the next session. I'll just quickly offer my own Philadelphia bona fides. My Philly connection began in the mid-50s when my mom was a physics PhD student at Penn. My older brother was born in Philly. My sisters and I right across the river in Camden, New Jersey. And I moved a long, long time ago, but my lovely wife is from Northeast Philly, and she shares a link with our facilitator today. They both have degrees from St. Joseph's University. My wife has a master's degree in education, and our speaker has an honorary doctorate in public service. So after serving on the city council for 15 years, Michael Nutter was elected mayor of the city of Philadelphia in 2008, serving for eight years, and along the way, serving as president of the, of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. His lasting impact includes improving both the quality of life and the business climate of the city. Among his many honors, he was named Public Official of the Year by Governing Magazine in 2014, and he now serves as the David N. Dinkins Professor of Professional Practice in Urban and Public Affairs at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. So it's my, uh, my honor to introduce the former college DJ mix master Mike, also known as former Mayor Michael Nutter. Good. Very good. That working. Yep. How's everyone? Good. All right. This crowd is dragging. This is really dragging. This is really dragging. What do you want to talk about? How's everybody? Good. Good? Okay. All right. They're slowly coming back to life. Okay. All right. Been a long day. Long weekend. Nothing wrong with a long weekend. I mean, work. Oh. I had to study well, to get yeah. ready for this conversation. No, because no, you, you have a job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I used to have one. <laughs> yeah, well, you're about to have a lot more. <laughs> My wife would be so happy. <laughs> so our whole conversation is going to be like this. I don't know what y'all were expecting us to talk yeah. about, but yeah. you've already plotted this out and figured Check you might email. find this more interesting than... See what's on. I was trying Netflix to remember tonight, all of the like details. That. Do they have any idea who we are? I mean, mm -hmm. were we actually introduced, or I think you were. Yeah, I mean, that was the most half-assed. Was he introduced? <laughs> experience. He was introduced. Yeah, was he was. You're supposed to introduce me. I'm introducing you. Yeah. <laughs> good afternoon. How's everyone? Excellent. All right. Very good. Yep, all right. right. Cranking it up. Cranking it's almost it up. spring. Yeah, yeah. So I want to outside. introduce you to a very, very good friend of mine, former secretary of the cabinet in President Obama's administration. I don't, what did you do in the Clinton administration? Uh, legislative affairs. And uh, he was Jordan in, Lewinsky. Um, he was in legislative affairs during a very challenging time in the government. Ladies and gentlemen, Broderick Johnson. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. My friend. It's good to see you, man. You too. All right, now that we got that out of the way. This is, we're talking about, this is the uh, internet? I think so. Is that we're talking about? Yeah. This is, yeah. okay. this is the state of the net. Yes, we're, we're talking state about the net. internet. Yeah. And we're talking about our views of the internet. And, yep. and uh, I like the internet. <laughs> it's good. It's very important. Yeah, it's very important. It has a lot to do with uh, with why I joined Comcast was so we could make the internet ubiquitous. Stop is, leaving is, people behind. Is that what you said in your interview? <laughs> really? Yeah, I said ubiquitous. Yep. Ubiquitous. And they hired That's you. It. Yeah, and they hired me. Damn. Didn't you call and put in a good word? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. I did, I, did, I did do that, yeah. They told me, I think, though, they, they said they appreciated my call. They had actually already made the decision. And I said, well, just let them know that I, you know, weighed in okay. on that. All right. So I'm taking all the credit. Yeah. <laughs> and you owe me a drink after this. <laughs> all right. We can do that, too. All right. We should probably get serious. Yeah. All right. You can tell we're friends. Very, very good friends. 
have done a lot of great work together over the years, too, in our roles in government and share a deep passion for the subject that we're going to talk about. And, you know, I think um, I'll let you ask me a question and then yeah. I'll try yeah, to answer. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, in the ubiquity of the Internet, and we've been, I mean, there are fights, debates, arguments, but I think it all crystallized in 2020 into 21, the significance of the internet. No question. And I'd love to hear your perspective, pre-Comcast and now Comcast. Sure. And, and, and you know, I'm sure you and I both share this with everyone in the room, um, the events that are happening in Ukraine and uh, such courage shown by the Ukrainians in the face of an unbelievable and unnecessary uh, onslaught, uh, war raged by Russia. But, you know, we get to watch through our digital devices uh, a, a lot of what's happening that we would not have seen before. And so in that sense, um, we're fortunate to know what's happening and for the rest of the world to know what's happening. Um, so I just, just wanted to start with, with uh, that concern and that observation. And, you know, for me, um, just in terms of how I came to this in the, for the first place, you know, I grew up in, in, uh, in Baltimore, very much like your hometown of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was very fortunate to be raised by um, working class parents who really had been denied so many opportunities themselves, but wanted to make sure that their children weren't denied opportunities and the tools of opportunities. And when I think about those tools, it was like encyclopedias, for example, all over the place, right? And they, they weren't there just by the way for access, right. which we get into. It was like, and right. you will open those. Yes. And you will learn from they will those. be used. And you'll be, you'll be quizzed about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also had Jet Magazine to learn from and Ebony and, and, and look, and those were the tools that we had. And so we know now, right, that the tools for knowledge are digitally based. And we know that throughout the pandemic, those tools have played such an integral role in the capacity and ability of people uh, to be able to do homework. We've got this tremendous problem with the homework gap, which existed before the pandemic and has been made even worse. But people were actually able to use the Internet uh, to continue their education. Uh, we know with regard to telehealth, how many people were able to keep in touch with their doctors and their health care providers as a result. And we know also then, of course, about workforce training and opportunities as well. So um, those are the tools now. Imagine if 10, 20, 30 years ago, we hadn't had this digital capacity to be able to keep up with information and stay competitive. Well, on the, one of the other points, and again, you know, we talk about uh, access, who has, who doesn't. You know, when testing finally became available, right, much of it, you had to sign up online mm -hmm. to get a test. And vaccines then became available, and then you had to pretty much sign up online mm -hmm. until the, you know, um, in Philly, we had a number of centers, you know, open up and Black Doctors COVID Consortium. Um, but in a lot of ways, again, if you do not have access, it is almost impossible for you to live. No, no question. No question. And even with all of the access sets available to people, uh, we know that perhaps the, the, the greatest, not perhaps, from our perspective, the greatest challenges now are about adoption. And not adoption having to do with affordability necessarily for so many millions of people, uh, but having to do with just awareness and an appreciation of the difference that it can make in people's lives. And that's what we really need to be focused on. And at Comcast, we are very focused on these adoption-related issues, but we can't do it ourselves. Right. Now, we have made tremendous investments. Private sector has made tremendous investments over these decades as we've really tried to address the digital divide and bring access, affordable access. But we still know that there are tens of millions of our friends and neighbors people we care about who aren't aware or don't have the trust 
or knowledge or skills to be able to use the internet. And that's what I'm so, so passionate about, right? Yeah. Because we can't leave people behind and we have a historic opportunity to not do that. You know, I was very, very fortunate uh, when I was mayor of Philadelphia, um, with Comcast leadership in the hometown, uh, but across the country, the beginning of Internet Essentials, mm -hmm. uh, focused on low-income populations, people who did not have a tablet or device in the home. If they did, they didn't have high-quality, uh, decent-quality um, Internet service. Uh, and I think over time, we have certainly helped a ton of K to 12 young people uh, excel. Um, that that I mean, it might sound a little wild to some people in this room. Um, that still today, a whole bunch of kids do not have access, uh, whether in the city or across the country, uh, to high quality internet or even a device uh, to use it on. Um, we have uh, schools uh, in our city that those days, maybe still today, corporations would, you know, maybe their last generation of computers, uh, they would donate. Still in good shape, uh, still decent. I mean, I don't really know that much about computers. I'm glad mine turns on every day. Um, but they we literally... Can we can help you. We have, oh, we have, oh, you have service? Yeah, we have some literate... No, we have literacy training programs that could help you with that. So we'll, we'll talk about that, though, on the... Can I sign? When we're having a drink, yeah. Okay. You yeah. should be signed up already, but we'll, well, we'll yeah. check that out. Uh, access, you know. But um, companies, in the goodness of their heart, would donate computers. And in many instances, the young people were existing in a building that was in a two-pronged world, and the rest of the world was in a three-pronged reality. They literally could not plug the computers in because the building was 60, 70, 80 years old. Now think about how do you get internet in that building as well? Where are you, where are you, running, those, where are you running those lines? Uh, and so there's a whole host of issues and challenges. This is a public-private challenge uh, for the United States of America. And I've said on many, many instances that if we looked at, and it's even more painful, of course, given the current events, but if we looked at education as a part of the national defense of the United States of America, how much stronger a country we would be. Now, I know we've got, you know, tremendous might and power, and I respect all of our people in uniform, um, but the real winning in this world is about knowledge, it's about information, it's about the transfer mm -hmm. of that information, the ability to rapidly communicate. You cannot take the GED test on paper anymore. You can only take it on a computer. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. Right. Yeah. And so that's where the awareness is, is important. And and you mentioned the, the private sector and, and the investments that the private sector has made. And now we have this tremendous opportunity working with government through the affordable, affordable uh, connectivity program, the ACP, to make uh, Internet access free again, for millions of people. We've had our low-cost Internet Essentials program, $9.95 a month has stayed constant for 10 years. While we have been investing, in the case of Compass, cast $30 billion in our networks, there have been $2 trillion in investments by, uh, by the industry writ large, 70 to $80 billion a year annually. So investments have been made in networks. We now have tremendous government subsidies, hopefully that will be permanent, that will allow people to be online. But again, it's the awareness, mm -hmm. right? It's distrust for government that keeps people from taking. And it's also a, sort of a, a failure for people to understand what difference it could make yeah. in their own lives. This is where, you know, we saw this with, um, with the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm where it was important to get people called navigators into these yeah. communities, you know, folks that are trusted by people in the neighborhoods mm -hmm. to say, no, this isn't a joke. This is real. This is an opportunity for you, yeah. and it can change your life. Yeah. And so that is, to me, perhaps, and for Comcast, we're putting so much resources into figuring all that out, community by community by community. Uh, I don't know whether that's your thing beeping or somebody's going to snatch the microphones away from us, but 
even as a total city guy, I mean, one of the areas I still have a great deal of concern about because as much as I was mayor of Philadelphia, I mean, you're kind of the mayor for the region, at least in, in Philly, the way, it's, the way it's laid out. And we've got, you know, significant suburban, exurban, and rural communities uh, nearby. And, I mean, the lack of uh, high-quality, affordable service in many of our rural areas uh, is a challenge. Uh, and there's a political opportunity to unite, um, not to get into politics, but to unite a variety of constituencies across a bunch of different aisles. If we could actually figure out um, how to get more uh, service uh, into rural communities. It is important for us in Philadelphia that the farmers in Lancaster have access to the internet for their crops and their uh, goods and services that then come to the city of Philadelphia. No disrespect to Whole Foods. I think not yet. Whole Foods does not grow food. Yet. Not yet. Maybe. The farmers, the, you know, the mushroom capital of the United States of America is in Kennett Square in Pennsylvania. The blueberry capital of America is in New Jersey, right? And a ton of other things. All of that product has to get to market. And they need information about the weather, about the soil, about a ton of different things. I mean, you know, the amount of technology involved in the uh, agriculture business, I mean, this is not just, you know, somebody with a plow and a mule and, you know, we're just going to kind of wait and see what happens. Right. So, look, we're all in this together, right? And, and that, that gets said so often when it's not true, but it is very true in this instance. And fortunately, again, because of bipartisan support in Congress... Uh, the Senate in particular, you know, we've seen uh, an incredible infrastructure investment being made and a lot of the broadband investment will help rural communities, right? So this isn't about, you know, urban versus rural or um, African Americans and Latinos versus the situation with white folks. However, we have to be aware of those disparities. And uh, I know folks who really focus on the data, we did this with my brother's keeper, for example, mm -hmm. focusing on data that could tell us where the disparities are so we can figure out how to address those disparities. Mm -hmm. Again, so we can all be in this together. Yeah. You know, there's a, there was a young woman who, by the way, and this just goes to how uh, the Internet is so important for opportunities and through the pandemic has made such a difference in individual lives. We all know stories. We've seen stories. We know members of our family we were able to keep in touch with as a result of the mm. fact that they had internet at home. There was a, a young woman from Philadelphia who uh, was given the opportunity to introduce the Vice President of the United States last week when uh, the administration, it was last week or the week before, but when the administration um, uh, celebrated the fact that 10 million people have signed up to the internet um, as a result of the EBB and ACP program. This young woman, she, she's a high school senior, and before the pandemic, she said her family didn't think they needed the internet, right? They learned very quickly that they needed the internet, so they were able to sign up with our Internet Essentials program. She was able to keep up in school, to excel in school, to apply for college online. She got accepted into her, her first choice. She will be the first in her family to go to college. We all, many of us know that experience. It's still yeah. the case for many families. Yeah. And she wants to be a lawyer. Can you imagine that? She wants to be a lawyer. Really? With, yeah. Should I talk to her? I can't. You should talk to her. I should talk to her. Yeah. She, she wants to be an immigration so lawyer, but, well, okay. but uh, just a fantastic. And again, from, from your hometown, it was because of the internet, though, she was able to, to keep up and her family was able to, to stay connected to each other as well. Yeah. And they're scattered all over the country and, yeah. and I'd say all over the world. Yeah. No, it's it's just it's amazing. I think it's it's the one thing. I mean, it literally has kept us together. You know, no question. Our families, our neighbors, in our communities, um, and I would suggest, to some extent, as a country. I mean, we're going to have our fights. We're going to have our debates. But I mean that that. Well, imagine if we didn't. I mean, just how much more isolated. How much yeah. more isolated will we be? Well, right. This, this is something you and I talked about right. last week. Isolation for many young people yeah. 
and, and communities be a um, like Philadelphia and Baltimore where yeah. they haven't been able to see their friends or yeah. members of their family like they, yeah. like they typically are used to. Yeah. And that is extremely important for them in terms of their lives. And mm-hmm. yet, whether it's mental health or physical health issues sure. for many of them, or even job opportunities, quite right. frankly, it's played, uh, played a right. huge role. I think some of that, I mean, each community is different, but, I mean, we've seen, you know, significant uptick in violence. And I think, you know, part of it is uh, related to the social isolation uh, and despair uh, that people are are experiencing. I I know at some point somebody's going to kind of gong show us out of here. Um, For the young people in the room, you can Google that. (laughs) <laughs> I just want to leave you with, with, with this thought. To the back to the way back in the way back machine of 2020. And wherever you were in, you know, depending on the community, March or February, March, somewhere in that time period, and somebody announced, you know, your city, your town, your company, something is shutting down. Go home. So we have a worldwide pandemic followed immediately by severe fiscal distress, companies and the public sector, followed by massive national, international racial reckoning, unrest, protests, some violence, and a fairly crazy presidential election. Fairly. All in one year. Mm -hmm. Any one of which would have been kind of a thing in and of itself. All four happened three of which are still going on, and for some people, the fourth one is still happening. (laughs) Right? This, the the impact of 2020 will stay with us for a while. And for some of the, I've teased you a little bit, but for some of the younger people in the room, for Broderick and I and and some others, you know, our default is always kind of, you know, well, 1968. Or we just talk about the 60s, right? It's all about the 60s. For many of you, it'll be 2020. Will be a point of inflection of a change in American and international life. Through it all, because you saw it all, because you were able to see it all, everything that happened every day in every community, you could see what was happening because you were connected. Right. And so we have to continue um, to connect millions more. It's not, it's not even, I wouldn't even put it that way. Because, you know, it's about empowering people. It's not the sense of telling people this is good for you because I said it's good for you. It's helping people to understand this is how they can empower themselves to change their own lives. And that's, that's a message that often gets lost in, mm-hmm. in the advocacy around issues like this. You know, helping people take advantage of opportunities themselves and not just being told you need to do this because Comcast said you should do this or President Biden said you should do this or Mayor Nutter said you you should do this, but people feel in that way themselves. I think a lot of young people get it and and a lot of young people know what's at stake and they just need to have the tools and the opportunities presented to them so they can work with their own families and communities to become part of this this global economy and this this global world. So, um, yeah, that's what it's about. So whatever you do, whatever your business is, I mean, just know that somehow, some way, every one of you has a role to play, is playing a significant role. And whether you meet any of these folks or not, you're having a positive impact on somebody's life every day from the work that you do. And there's just nothing like it. So, so, so before someone hits the gong, and yeah. again, for those of you who they don't seem know, to be just letting us go, I think we should just, you, you know, you should, I mean, we, we should just check take out advantage. the gong show. Just, although, just, just keep talking. Yeah, what are you going to do? My favorite show is actually Family Feud, and Family Feud's been on for a long time, too. But yeah. Steve here's Harvey's a, here's a doing well on that. Steve Harvey's first name is Broderick, by the way, just in case you all didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, his, his mom. I don't think that would have gone... I think it just doesn't roll like Steve Harvey. I guess not. On the TV. Oh, well, I beg to differ. But anyway, <laughs> but I wanted to leave you all with a, with a couple key messages that um, hopefully you've got out of our brief fireside chat. And if you, even if you haven't, I want to leave you with these messages. First, um, again, we've talked about this. Broadband kept us connected during the pandemic. 
And this was the result of massive private sector investment that was also focused on the future. So when the pandemic hit, it wasn't like, oh, how are we going to handle this? Second, the digital divide certainly remains. I remember talking about the digital divide when I worked in the Clinton administration. Back then, it was about connectivity largely. Again, now I would say an awful lot of it is about adoption. We're making progress on both, but we have a long way to go. Next, with all this infrastructure money that's being spent, it needs to be spent smartly. We don't need to see duplicative efforts that result in money being, being wasted. Um, you know, for many, another message for many low income families, certainly struggling to make ends meet. It's challenging to think about signing up to the internet, but broadband service is affordable for so many millions of those families now as a result of the Affordable Connectivity Act. Broadband, why does it matter? You know, jobs, jobs of the future, educational opportunities, telehealth, all those things. And then finally, let me say this about costs. So while our companies, Comcast certainly among them, has invested so much in our networks, the costs of broadband has stayed relatively low and certainly relative to inflation. Um, it has stayed, uh, stayed well below inflation in many other industries and by a, a non-adjusted inflation, we've actually seen decline in prices. Though that's information that really matters because if we get stuck in a debate that is sort of the, the political debate around things like affordability without understanding that adoption is one of our biggest challenges, we lose sight of the difference that we can make. So those are the, the points I wanted to end with besides saying that it's great to be here with you, man, and to, okay. and to appreciate the, the work that we're doing together by bringing these issues to the forefront. But sure. we also worked on My Brother's Keeper together, and, and this mayor is mayor of Philadelphia, and I see Kip Wainscott, who was on our White House staff. It's great to see you, Kip. And he knows how much effort we put into My Brother's Keeper working with mayors like you okay. and the difference that it, can, that it made and continues to make. So, yeah. my brother, it's Thank great you. to spend this time with you. Absolutely. So um, I have a earpiece in, and um, they said that the next group was deferring their time <laughs> and that we could just, just stay and talk some more. Where's your earpiece connected to? Oh, I'm. Oh, it's it's. I got it from Internet Essentials. Uh, I'm, I'm fully wired. And you are on message. Except I'm not sure that that message came from anybody with, uh, with Comcast. Because we know there are others here. Just, who, just wait and see what well, somebody well. says. I mean, you know, this is what I get to do now. You know, you know the. You know, being mayor was great, but you know what's an even better job? What? Former. <laughs> Well, you, you, know, you were a great mayor. Wow, well, thank you. Were you were a great mayor. Thank you. And you continue to be a great leader. So well, I'm trying. It's an honor. Thank so, you. I guess that's it, huh? Yeah, because my earpiece is saying we uh, have to go now. Oh, okay. You know, I don't get many speaking opportunities. So, you know, I got I to gotta, I gotta do as long as I can. <laughs> I'm a good, All right, thanks, y'all. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Thank you.